Hello, my name is Tom Cronin. In 1991 and 1992, I conducted a comprehensive series of interviews on camera with a diverse, often eclectic, cross-section of Orleans residents. Some I knew personally, others I had never met. All had a solid connection to Orleans. The intent of these interviews was to record through the eyes of the people and their experience their history of the town. Funding for the series was provided by a generous grant from the Community Preservation Council of $18,000 and a further contribution of $12,000 from American Heritage Realty, now Cape Cod Ocean View Real Estate. I sincerely hope you enjoy our series, In Those Days, Historic Voices of Orleans. Drove into town from Washington, big shot. You know, and a little green Morris, new Morris miner. I sent up, had the plates from Massachusetts and sent down to Washington, put them on the car. Drove into town. No sooner got at the stoplight by Jimmy Laurie's gas station than uh, this tall cowboy walked off the curb and arrested me. So I wasn't in town two minutes before I was under arrest, and that, that's how it all began. Right. When you what? came, when you came to Orleans, um, at that point, had you p purchased the Cape Codder? Yeah, I bought it from Jack Johnson, and uh, uh, as, uh, May first was the day I was supposed to take over, and I arrived to take over, and Bill Payne arrested me. See? Well, Bill Payne was a registry of motor vehicles inspector in the area. He lived down on Town Cove, near where Delhi used to live on the Cove, and. Uh, he was a very nice guy, and he didn't know me from Adam, of course, but I didn't have an inspection sticker on the car. May 1st was inspection date back in 51. I don't know if it still is or not. No, it's different now, but May 1st was inspection date, and uh, I drove into town with new plates and everything, but no inspection sticker. So he hauled me over into Jimmy's station and talked to me and I explained when I was just coming in what happened he kept looking at me so you know a little bit strange so they had to roll a little green Morris miner over to Tubby's garage the Texaco station which was then known as Tubby's I heard Wilcox owned it then <clears throat> and put a sticker on it and then we uh, uh, from that time on uh, Bill and I were became very good friends, but mm -hmm. it was a little bit of a <laughs> shocking introduction to the town, and it went from went downhill from there. <laughs> you see. But but it was uh, it was typical of those days because the old timers around were uh, were real old timers. There aren't many of them left now, and and uh, and I was 35 years old at that point, so you know I was still pretty young, although I didn't think of myself as young. <clears throat> but uh, so I had to pick up and get introduced around town to some of these people, and uh, not only Orleans, but some of the other towns too. And I, uh, <laughs> I can remember getting introduced in the center of Orleans by old Kurt Dory, who 
ran the ran Dory's coffee shop up where Baxton Soul is now. It was that was the place where everybody sat in the stools and had coffee in the morning. And Jack Johnson had introduced me to Kurt, and Kurt gave me a once over with a sort of a skeptical eyes anyway. He also had a certain mischievous uh, quality about him. The first morning I came in for some coffee of my own, he grabbed me and there was a line of about six, seven, or eight uh, old guys sitting at the counter with their coffee. I remember old George Eldridge and I think, uh, I think Norman Hopkins was there, but guys with that vintage. And th this mischievous little uh, Dory <laughs> says, Oh, fellas, I want you to meet uh, the fellow that just uh, bought out Jack Johnson. And, uh, and he had this look in his eyes when he was looking at him saying, do you want to see a real live one? This is it. So they all, t their heads all turned and I'll never forget the looks on these guys' faces. Perfectly polite, but their eyes were looking at me to say, boy, look at this guy. He was dumb enough to buy the silly newspaper, you know. It was just, that's about the way it started. How, how long, how old was uh, Cape Cotter at that point? Uh, Jack had had it for five years. He bought it. He, I mean, he started it five years before. It really wasn't too much of a paper. It was quaint, mm -hmm. but, but it uh, was suffering badly. Mm -hmm. And Jack pretty much ran it out of the back of his automobile and had it printed down in the armist. So <clears throat> it wasn't. Uh, this was definitely not a corporate takeover. No, it really <laughs> wasn't a corporate takeover. <laughs> I could tell you the price, but you wouldn't believe it. It was five thousand bucks. Wow! So it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't really a very big deal. But five thousand bucks to those guys, and I think they didn't know how much I paid, but they suspected I'd paid too much if I paid anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, the, the, those guys were around town. I remember Shaq Chase uh, used to sit on one of the benches up by the old cemetery near Dory's there. He'd be up there in good weather every day with a, uh, he looked, he was a, Shaq was a tall guy with a jutting chin who looked sort of like a tall Popeye. He always had a little pipe sticking out of the corner of his mouth and he, uh, he was the, one of the local guys. So I remember sitting down on the bench to talk to him one day shortly after I got into town and the only wisdom that he imparted to me was something I always remember. He said, Orleans is a town of uh, widows and three-legged dogs. And then I said, Jesus. You know, I looked around, I, I noticed there were a lot of three-legged dogs in town for some reason. Around the center of town, there were about three of them that you'd see all the time. I don't know why they were three-legged. You never but found out? Never found out what, what made him three-legged, but I wasn't sure about the widows, but uh, Shaq obviously knew about the widows. <laughs> but I did see these three-legged dogs. That was his description of Orleans. I think he was born in Brewster, so, uh -huh. so he had that detached view of Orleans. I wanted yeah. to ask you about the yeah. about the the paper itself. Yeah. As, as long I've been here about twenty five or thirty years, and, yeah. and as far as I can remember, the Cape Cotter has consistently had this look about it yeah. and this tone about it that I really like. Uh huh. And how, what changes did you make when you bought it, and what <coughs> when how long um, um, has it? Um, had this look, you know, the familiar look that, that we... Yeah, it was gradual. Uh, it had something to do with Vernon Smith, uh, because um, the paper was a pretty stubby little thing, and it was printed down in Yarmouth, and we had to keep printing it down there for a couple of years until we got this building put up uh, in 53, which is a couple of years later. So we had to go down to Yarmouth every day with the coffee and stuff. And so it was a gradual transition. It pretty much stayed the same until we got up here and got our own presses and got, got going on it and gradually changed. And the, the flag, you know, the, the, on the top of the front page was designed by Vernon Smith with little boats in it and stuff. 
it's, his design. So it that. takes on the look of one of his panels, really. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. Vernon, I never knew that. that yeah, that's yeah, interesting. Vernon did that. He also did the sign out front, that little green swinging sign with a printer on and the old press and so forth. Vernon did that, too. It was sort of a corny flag, but it was uh, distinctive to, to the Cape Codder. Mm -hmm. That was Vernon. Vernon uh, was very helpful back in the beginning. He was one of those guys. His painting, one of his paintings up there, you know. But uh, I like so. I like the uh, the editorial approach of the Cape Codder. It seems to me that um, there's passing reference made to the outside world yeah. and international or national events, yeah. but it's really our our town and our paper. It seems to me. Yeah, that's really the function of a, of a, of a local paper like this. Once in a while we sound off on national and international stuff, but. That really isn't what we're here to do. Mm. Sometimes we can't resist it, but we should resist it when we do it. But it's a, you know it's a, the local paper, and you should be, editorially you should be commenting on local issues. Mm -hmm. The the other thing I find interesting is that um, let's compare Orleans to New York City for a minute. New York City supports three newspapers: the New York Post, and the New York Times, and yeah. the Daily News. Yeah. And Orleans really supports three newspapers. Yeah. The Cape Cod Times has an office here, yeah. the Oracle, and the, and the Cape Codder. Yeah. I don't know of another town on Cape Cod that... Yeah. that uh, That's true. Of course, the Oracle has a thing they put out here, but they don't even have an office in Orleans anymore. So, uh. But they're in the armies now. Because it's new ownership and so forth. It used to be when Eddie mm -hmm. and Mary Smith were running it. it was as local as you can get, but uh, but that's that's changed a good deal. But the uh, the paper should is a local paper, and hey, <laughs> you just should stay with the local stuff. And, and, and that's where our function. If we do it right, or we do it, we do it well if we can, or if we goof up, and we goof up a, a lot, but. Uh, but you should stick with the local scene. That's what we've always, always done. We, we, the paper gradually developed that. Uh, <clears throat> didn't really have editorials when Jack ran it. It was quaint. It was, it was country, all right. <clears throat> but uh, we gradually turned it into a newspaper, and. Uh, and, and you know, it, it had its tough days because. The, the business was very uh, limited, and it was really tough going for a long time. And when we got, I guess the paper, the paper began to get some some recognition. When uh, probably the most, probably the best thing we ever did was uh, the way we uh, led the fight on the national seashore, and that battle was a bloody local battle uh, back in the late 50s and early 60s. It was uh, really <coughs> uh, touch and go. And well, when you say you led the battle, were you well, leading we, the battle for the government forces or yeah, for... The yeah, we were for the seashore mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning. And we, had, we lucked out there because uh, there was a... We were the first newspaper that had a story about the possibility that this was going to happen. Nobody would believe that it was going to happen, but we knew it was because we were lucky. Uh, we had a state senator back in those days named Ed Stone. He was a remarkable old guy, Republican conservative guy, but he had a conservation streak in him. Uh, he was a retired president of a big insurance company and he was very well off and he was he was uh, canny as hell, and he was a good friend of ours. He'd come in and talk to us a lot. And one day he walked in and he said, I've got something. He, he had a big briefcase always. He brought out this big, thick study, uh, pr printed study. He said, this is something I think you'd like to see. So he said, okay. Well, it turned out to be a study by the Old Dominion Foundation, uh, a national foundation, which had made a study about the possibility of creating a, a national park on Cape Cod. 
and he thought we'd be interested in it. Well, we were interested, all right, because it was uh, proposed for out here on the Outer Cape. It wasn't for any place else. It was out in our area. What year would that have been, Malcolm? That must around. have been uh, around 56 or 7, 1956 or 1957. And so he left it with us to read. We digested it. It was a hell of a story, and we broke the story. And no one would really believe that this could possibly happen. I suspect that Ed Stone uh, got this through. Uh, he lived in Oyster Harbors, a fancy place, you know, a lot of money place. And I think he was a, a pretty good friend of Paul Mellon's. And Paul Mellon, uh, the Mellon family, I think, had the money in the Old Dominion Foundation. And I think that that was where the money came from for their studies. And so they gave it to Ed Stone. Ed Stone leaked it to us because he wanted, politically, he wanted to get this out. So we, we got it out all right. And uh, I remember... And that's when the fur began to fly around yeah, here. Yeah, it really right? began to fly. Charlie <laughs> Frazier, who was the, you know, the big boss in Wellfleet, uh, snorted and snarled and went at it. You know, he, he laughed at us. He made fun of us. He said, I think he thought we were smoking something that we shouldn't have been smoking or something like that. But Charlie would not believe that this was true. Well, it turned out that it was not only true, but it was much closer to happening than they, th than they thought, because it, the seed had been planted in the Interior Department. And uh, both Senator Leverett Saltonstall and Senator, a guy named John F. Kennedy, was the other senator at the time, uh, they were, liked the idea, thought it was a great idea. so they. They got behind the legislation, and Hastings Keith, who was our congressman at the time, somewhat more reluctantly, but he joined them. So the three of them got legislation going, and uh, the battle got underway and, and eventually was won. But uh, locally, it was not a very popular thing, uh, particularly in the business community. And of course, did you personally receive a lot of criticism? Uh, yeah, for we, got, we had a lot of criticism, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can remember, you know, we there was no advertising boycott against us, but there was advertising was cut, uh, and we didn't uh, get advertising we should have been getting, and, and there, we just we we just caught hell all over the place. The I can remember uh, Alton Smith, the, the, the Smith boys, A.S. Smith and Sons. <coughs> I, I always liked Alton, but he was so dead set against the park and he was so mad at me for, for supporting it that we never did get an inch of advertising out of, out of A.S. Smith after that, although Alton and I stayed friendly and we used to talk about it a lot, but no more money out of Alton for that sort of thing. And even even guys like Josh Nickerson, uh, who was a, a friend and had always been friendly, but when this happened, Josh was upset too. And of course, Nickerson Lumber was a big advertiser. And, and Josh, one day, Josh called me up and gave me an unshirted hell on the telephone about our position, the editorial position, the support of this thing. He, he just uh, couldn't understand it and he, he, he went on and on and on and finally I had to say to him, I, I, I got so tired of this tirade, I finally said to him, well look Josh, that's all very well but, but I'm running this paper. And Josh said, yes, I know you are, and I don't like it. Bang! <laughs> <laughs> hung up on me, you see. And so, uh, but Josh, to his credit, as far as we were concerned, never cut his advertising. He didn't, uh, he didn't cancel his advertising, certainly. And we still were <laughs> friends, but, uh, and of course Josh became the first, uh, he became convinced of the thing too, eventually, and became the first chairman of the advisory commission of the National Seashore when it passed and it was very helpful to getting the thing underway once it got going. But so in he those saw early the early days, the, the things were 
a little a little rugged. So that's the thing we're most proud of because that set aside you know around thirty five thousand acres and uh, and if, if we didn't have that today, this area of the Cape would be a lot worse off. It'd be decimated. Uh, yeah, it really would. Yeah, and there's no way you could establish a park with uh, the congestion that they no, would have uh, no. would have developed over the years. So it, you know it's had its. Uh, it's had its rough points and so forth. Basically, it's been a great thing for us, I think. Yeah. You, you know, you, you mentioned uh, that the advertisers, when you took an editorial stance, how the advertisers, some of them disappeared on you. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me, in observing the operation of the paper over the years, that that you've been able to, to concentrate <coughs> on the paper and the tone of the paper. And it, it doesn't appear to me that you've really, that you personally have really involved yourself with the business of the paper. I imagine you had to in the beginning, but yeah. your function here pretty much has been setting the editorial tone right. and, and really not, and you've had good people that can take care of the business end of it. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, uh, that's exactly what it was. I was very naive uh, and still am on the business side. I was a newspaper man, you know, I've always been a newspaper man. So I, I, uh, I just didn't. I just wasn't good at this, and it's a miracle that I ever got through. And the reason I got through, basically, was that uh, I had some friends who helped. Uh, the Donham family was the principal one. But Phil Donham, who was with Arthur D. Little at that time, was was helpful. He, uh, we had, we didn't have much. Uh, help from the local banks either because, well, it didn't look like, a good, I don't blame them, it was just didn't look like a good business deal and it really wasn't a good business deal, but but uh, they steered us in the right direction. Uh, Phil Donham, who's dead now, uh, uh, was largely instrumental in getting us set up with the old uh, First National Bank of Boston, which helped us a great deal, and for some reason, <laughs> they uh, they backed me personally, and I never could quite understand why they did that. But uh, Phil used to always say, "Look, you don't understand. The Bank of Boston, uh, the old First National Bank of Boston, it's a different bank now, but uh, was in, identified with a lot of small businesses in New England and." during the Depression, and the last thing they could do is to do something that would put a weekly newspaper out of business. They would try to help, and so they did, and, and they were, but it was because of the Donham family's influence, I think, that this happened, rather than uh, mm -hmm. my personal character or anything like that, but it was, this was luck. And then Paul Donham, uh, who was <coughs> Harvard Business School professor, uh, began to just pro bono give us a lot of good advice and so forth. And then when he left the faculty up at the community college, why we convinced him to to come to work for us and, and really take over the business side. Mm -hmm. And so it's really Paul's Paul has should have the credit for the success of the paper in, in terms of its economics and business because I uh, I was hopeless at mm -hmm. that. I, I was an editorial man, always have been, had been, and uh, probably always will be. So, but I'm sure it gave you a freedom to really um, yeah, yeah, um, that, discuss the issues the the way yeah, and the manner yeah, that you wanted he, to. He understood that. He understood, and he just took that big load off my shoulders, and otherwise it would never have flown. So I really have a lot of I owe the, the Donums an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that uh, you've got to get going to the Lynn Hall for, yeah. for lunch pretty right. soon. And I yeah. wanted to, we talked earlier about um, this town and how it's changed. And I, yeah. I think also how it hasn't changed. Um, yeah. And I was saying earlier how around 1980, I think just after the 70s, I started to see uh, people showing up at lunch at the Lynn Hall right. in pinstripe suits and yeah. dark business suits and banker gray and so forth. Yeah, you're right. And um, prior to that, it had always been usually the same old gang around right. town. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, um, 
I, I have a list of names in my mind I just want to throw yeah. by you because it seems like um, it's a different it's a different uh, town in one respect mm. than it is now well, and some of the, some of the people that you you'd run into almost on a daily basis in the hoe yeah. at lunch for instance yeah. would be a, a Frank Richards and yeah. uh, uh, Sumner Robinson and, right. and uh, a Tommy Nickerson, Paul Henson, yeah. uh, Gaston, yeah. Ivor, <laughs> Jimmy yeah. Delore would be across the street at the yeah. gas station, and uh, Jackie, <laughs> right. Jackie Higgins and yeah. Del Johnson. Yeah, Dick um, Del. Yeah, Del. And, uh, you know, you'd see Fritz Hobner around town and yeah. Charlie yeah. Moore, Ed yeah. Smith. Right. And uh, that seems like it was a much more familiar, our town was a more familiar town. I don't know if it's me, like being an old yeah. man reminiscing about uh, the old days, but it seems like our town's not quite as familiar as it was. Oh, that's very uh, true. Of course, a lot of that was the Grim Reaper. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of it died. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of guys that uh, just uh, aren't here anymore, you know, the, of those names you mentioned, uh, I bet seventy-five percent of them are, are gone, mm. and uh, it's it's uh, the town has changed. I mean, the t tenor of the town. You don't see whenever you see one of the old familiar faces, it's like uh, Christmas. God, <laughs> how are you? In the old days, you would probably said hi. You know, you mm. see them all the time. But now, when you see somebody like that, you say, Jesus, great to see you. How what how things? You know, and you get talking and. But it's a smaller group now. It's a very small core, and you don't see them that often. And it's a bloody shame. So in that sense, or you know, Orleans has has changed. But yeah. in another sense, I think that our town is really it's kind of insulated from major change. I don't. I think yeah. you're not going to see. We're we pretty much uh, established. The town has established itself over the years gradually. Yeah. Yeah. So that. Um, Although it's changed, it really hasn't either. And, and I, I think in the future, um, there aren't a lot of changes that can really, you know, make yeah. a difference here. I would think. I, I, I don't <laughs> think. I think the changes have been made. The, the two big changes are the shopping centers on both ends of the town. That 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 was not uh, a terribly great thing for the mm -hmm. cohesiveness of the of the town center, certainly and. For the business community, I think I think it was, it was just too bad. But I think that's done, and it's been pretty much resolved. And I think now it's a, just a question of rebuilding that center of the town, strengthening that town center. Perhaps uh, the Orleans, Orleans Shopping Plaza, which is sort of uh, getting very shoddy and so forth, and, and untenanted to a large degree. One of the keys is going to be to some do some radical changes in that area and make it a downtown type of place, rather than a remote coal shopping center. But or I think Orleans is is really too. It's like a microcosm of the United States because the yeah. same trend has happened across the country where the shopping malls and the, yeah. and, and the, and the shopping by automobile yeah. uh, has left the town centers. Uh, yeah, it's a coldness that's yeah. settled, a cultural coldness. It's just a, I don't think it's been good, I, but I think that things are beginning to change. I had an editorial recently about what's going on in Mashpee, where they've done that. They bulldozed an old shopping center there and made a downtown out of it. And Mashpee has never had a downtown, actually, because it's stretched along. 28, and it's, it doesn't really have a center. It's sort of like some of the other, like East Amp, doesn't really have a center. But uh, what these guys did there was they bulldozed the whole damn thing down, put in some streets, made some small shops, lined the streets, planted some trees, and put in a library and a church, and, and it's a pedestrian type of downtown area now and it's, it's apparently being quite become quite successful and this is what I think we need in Orleans in that shopping plaza somehow that could be done it'd be a, it'd be a great idea great thing mm. solidify the town help <coughs> it a lot but it's still a great town and uh, I think it's you know one way or another it's going to continue to be I hope you don't have any uh, immediate uh, career changes uh, planned. 
I think that um, God I, may have some. I think. For me, but <laughs> but I, don't, I don't have many. Yeah. Yeah, no. I, As I, I said, I think that the Cape Cod is a jewel, a little jewel in this well, town. It's a wonderful little newspaper, and I think it really reflects our town. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you're the guy responsible for that. And I hope that even with a change of ownership, um, mm. uh, uh, you've made sure that, that there won't be any major changes here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think everything's going to be is coming along pretty well. I and mean, Greg is doing a whale of a job. He's got a lot of energy, and he's really piling it in there and I think he's gonna, gonna do a do a very good job. In the meantime I just, you know, uh, give a lot of free advice and, and uh, write some editorials now and then and that sort of thing and enjoy myself. So uh, and I but I'm very optimistic about how the paper's going. It certainly has a much solider uh, financial uh, backing even in these horrible times, uh, in these tough economic times for newspapers particularly. Uh, I think we're in much better shape than uh, a lot of things and so I feel very encouraged and very happy about it. I think it's going to be great.